who know this or not, but we have John Ratzenberger here to see us today. And I'll give you a little fact while I have you here. The role of Cliff did not exist until he went for his run-through. So, if you will all give me a nice, warm Phoenix Comic Con welcome for the illustrious John Ratzenberger. They did do a really nice job on it, although all of the voices sounded the same to me. 
We'll figure it out. I know. So just to remind you all, we are running this as a Q&A. I have a microphone right here and a microphone over here. If you'd like to ask John any questions, please feel free to come up, take a kneel, take a seat, and then we'll get to you and we'll ask John all the questions so away. We have right an here. hour. Please come up with questions. What's your name? We'll start with you right here. My name is Patrick and I have two questions for you. Okay. One is, what is your favorite um, part on the Pixar campus? The uh, uh, part where the rose bushes are. <laughs> Just near the parking lot. <laughs> do you want to know what uh, part that I, I, I'm playing the most in the, when I was at the Pixar campus? So that's another way. That's probably what you meant, right? Um, I uh, I like P.T. Fleet. I like Pete because he's he's, uh, he's so avaricious. He, it's funny. It's avaricious uh, because he's he just he, he would sell his grandmother for about twenty five. <laughs> he doesn't care. It's, I, it just makes me laugh when I when I voice him. Well, what was the second question? If. They asked you to come back for Incredibles 2 as the underminer. Would you come back? If they asked me to come back? If, if they asked me <clears throat> to build a tool shed, I'd come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's such a joy with, with Pixar because their standard of work is so high. Um, it's, it, it's just here. They never lower their standard. You know, get lazy, you know, and say, well, we don't have to teach cursive in schools anymore, that kind of thing. <laughs> like, keep it right there. That's the standard. Your job is to meet it. Period. And that's what they do. And, uh, before, do we have the house lights up? You're welcome, Peter. Yeah. Uh, is there any uh, active military or veterans out there? Can you stand up, please? very much for your service because uh, without, without you doing what you do and what you've done we can't do what we do that's uh, there's you know there's no arguing with that so thanks thanks once again and uh, we have a, a group over here I'm not doing with the house lights do you guys mind if the house lights are up no because uh, you know maybe one of you want to catch a nap or something <laughs> but, I, but I, I, it's nice to see the faces out there Thank you, light, lighting people. Hey, there you go. Um, so my question is, how does it feel to be, like, have the voice of a lot of Pixar characters? How does it feel to have the voices? Is it like the soup? <laughs> Flaming death! Uh, I am the underminer! <laughs> it's hard to get to sleep at night. <laughs> I keep looking around the room like, who's that? Who's that? Who said that? But it's um, it's just something I do. It's like uh, it's like being a carpenter and you have a lot of different tools in your in your bag. When you walk in to do the job, you're not quite sure which tool you're going to use, but it's good that you have them with them. So I look at it in the same way when I walk into a job. It's, it's what, you know, sing and dance and whatever it's going to take. Um, you're too young. You probably didn't see Dancing with the Stars, did you? But it's that, so it gets back in, you know, the golden age of Hollywood, all actors were expected to sing, dance, you know, go, do stage, television, radio, cartoons, whatever it is. You were just expected to have those skills. So, but anyway, that's, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The very polite children. Well, first off, I'd like to say thank you for coming here. Uh, when I heard you were coming, I was so excited because I've been a big fan of yours ever since I was like four years old. And I've seen every Pixar movie because of you. And I've liked every single character you've done. But my question isn't about Pixar. 
It's actually, what has been your favorite place to go when you did Made in America? Oh, because um, that was like one of my shows my parents and I would always try and catch. Yeah, when I did Made in America, um, there were two things. One was ge geographical of the Swamp. This is a, a beautiful place to be kind of thing. And the other was the, the product. I was very impressed with uh, it's a company up in New Hampshire called Sturm Ruger. Um, and they make, they make rifles, but they oh. do really hand carve, you know, I, I, the artistry of, you know, people who sit down with a tiny little tool for hours and hours and, you know, either carve wood or metal and, and it's, it's, I would love to have one of those big machines right in the middle of my living room. I, I just love looking at them because even the, you know, the people that, you know, you get a hunk of metal and now you've got to shave it down into the shape of something that uh, is maybe the tolerances are like one twenty thousandth of an inch. And if you make a mistake one way or the other, you got to throw the thing away. But people do that every single day. So wherever I went with Made in America, that's that's what I uh, that just amazed me and then made me so proud to be in America. That's that's what they do every single day. That's why I love that show. Yeah, thanks. thank you. Yeah, my mother was uh, working in a factory, and I remember one night picking her up, it was a blizzard up in New England, and uh, certainly not here. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they're all coming out, and very cold, and I remember thinking, there should be an audience here every day just applauding people who do that kind of work, you know, that's the hard work that keeps all our, the infrastructure going, you know, keeps the water running, the electricity on, and, uh, but anyway, that's so. We might, we may be doing the show again. How do you make up all your voices? How do I? All those voices. Well, I, I, voices. I, I look at the character, and sometimes they just say, you know, "Hand me the pig" was a lot like Cliff, and uh, this is just, but. Um, I got Tatui, Mustafa the waiter. He was very jowly. He had big, big jowls. So I had to. People who have big jowls with a brown, big yellow brown. He just sort of talk like that, so that's, that's, that's what I do. Just sort of visually see you know, what, what kind of noise would be coming out of them. Thank you. You're welcome. Pixar or in my career? In your entire career. And, um, <clears throat> because I lived in England for 10 years before coming to Los Angeles and, and uh, grabbing that brass ring that was Cheers. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but there was one job that just, that just makes me laugh. Um, it was, a, it was a, uh, a war film called Bridge Too Far. And, uh, I had scenes with Robert Redford every day, and uh, so our trailers were right next to each other. So we come out of the trailer at the same time because we're going to the same place, and uh, and all the locals, all the Dutch, we filmed that in Holland, and all the Dutch locals obviously rushed right over to Robert Redford and handed him, you know, for autographs, the little books and pencils. And I thought, wow, I can think of this. It was like my like fourth film I'd ever done in my life. So for me, it's like. Wow, I'm working with Robert Redford, kind of thing. It was a real treat. So every day, the same thing, over and over again for two, three weeks. And then on the last day, uh, they had to make me with some, uh, what was it? they put a lot of glue and makeup on me because the scene called for me, and I was in a boat like this, and, and I catch a bullet here, which takes off this side of my face. And you see it for a half a second on screen. But So they had to do all the makeup here. So I was completely unrecognizable, obviously. So the same morning, just like every other morning, uh, I stepped out of my trailer to go to the set, and Robert Redford stepped out of his, and all the locals, about 20 or 30 of them, started rushing up to Robert Redford, but 
Somebody stopped, they looked at me, and then they all turned around and rushed to me. You know, you have no idea who I am. <laughs> so, it, being unrecognizable, I, I, everybody wanted my autograph. And, and to do a service to Robert Redford, because he was such a nice man, I, I signed all the autographs, Robert Redford. <laughs> and I don't think, I, I never told him that. That's just what's, that's what a memory, but you know, living in Europe for 10 years is obviously a lot of them. Thank you. You're welcome. What's it like to be in all the Pixar movies? It's cool because I, I get free stuff. <laughs> yeah, hats, t-shirts, mugs. And I got a whole garage full of them. But it's, it's nice, too, because um, they had some space in their studio, and I said, you know you've got space enough here for a pool table. <laughs> That's a game I, I, I like playing, so they put in a couple of pool tables. <laughs> so that's one of the treats for Oregon with Pixar. You get to shoot pool. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, I'm a big fan of Cheers. I know that uh, you came up with the character of Cliff. Yeah. You know, um, but how much input did you have over the seasons, you know, and how that character developed and his little quirks and idiosyncrasies? Uh, full control. <laughs> yeah, no, because yeah, I invented the character. Uh, and also, even with the costuming, I had uh, the, the costume uh, fella hike up the cuffs of the trousers about that high so he could see the white socks. <laughs> Um, and that was my homage to a, a, a comic, comedy actor um, from France called Jacques Tati, who, uh, if you get a chance, is a movie called uh, Mr. Hulot's Holiday, which has me on the floor. I mean, I'm holding my gut, laughing hysterically. And John Cleese also used him as a model. Because uh, I had a conversation with John not too long ago. But we were both really taken with this, this French uh, comedian actor. Um, so I uh, um, would you know, adjust the costume, but all the idiosyncrasies and stuff, that was all me. Yeah. The lines I would change as well sometimes. <laughs> but I learned that the first year you don't change the lines during rehearsal. You wait until the audience is there and the cameras are rolling. <laughs> Because then the writers can't argue with you. So the audience laughs at the joke, you wait. And they said it was okay. The jury said it was okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You look awesome. Oh, no, I can't think of that. You're so sweet. Yeah, because they, they know what to do. But I'm admiring the view from here. It's a great view. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thankfully, I wore my cologne this morning. <laughs> Um, kind of took my question, but uh, I'm a huge I'm a huge legit, I'm a huge, legit, one. Yeah, yeah, I'm a huge legit fan. What's your favorite memory just from working on that show? Oh, legit! You yeah. broke that news to me the other day. And I didn't know yeah, yeah, they had to cancel that show. Um, uh, it just it was they, they were so because um, obviously you know with uh, Kinder in the audience, we can't explain a lot of the jokes, but. Um, <laughs> It, 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 they really pushed the envelope, but somehow they came right back and at the end of the episode you go, wow, that was sweet. Wasn't that nice? Even though in the episode you go, oh my God, what are they doing? <laughs> what did that guy say? Huh? But by the time you know, the end comes, everyone's petting a puppy, you know. <laughs> oh, but it was just extraordinary the way they did that. Thank you so much. You bet. Um, one of them is actually, what was your favorite school subject? School subject? Um, there was two. I, I've always been an avid reader. Um, geography. Uh, to this day, I love maps. And you know, that being a, I don't know, I'm a sailor too, so the, the, the part I love most of it is the navigation and the charts and taking out all the 
all the tools and the compasses and chart the course and you know, you know, 280 degrees north and blah blah blah. It makes me feel like I'm in a Star Wars episode or something. <laughs> and, and, um, um, and, and reading, um, my favorite author when I was young, young, seven, eight years old, was uh, James Fenimore Cooper. And I think that got me into trouble as an adult because I, 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 the, the main character, which is Natty Bumpo, Nathaniel Bumpo, um, that's the main character that you know, Daniel Day Lewis played in The Last of the Mohegans. His Christian name is Nathaniel Bumpo, and the Indians would give him names you know, like Hawkeye and Deerslayer, etc. But um, and I, I was just always fascinated with that particular character because he would just go off into the woods. He, he, he took a long rifle, some beef jerky, he's gone. He doesn't know anybody, he's got no cell phone. And I said, well, I, I, well, that takes a lot of courage. To just say, yeah, well, well uh, I'm gonna go see you. I'm gonna go to Manitoba. <laughs> what, where? And so, when I got older, I did exactly that. That's kind of the, the I was a traveling uh, uh, journeyman carpenter after college. And, and one day I said, you know, I gotta go visit England. And I went to England and uh, got there five dollars in my pocket. And uh, but survived and stayed there 10 years, and that's where I started my career. So, long answer to a short question, but the, those are my favorite subjects in school, but that's how that subject reading really, really affected my life. Study tips. Study tips? <laughs> um, it, it, I, I would say, well, I know that it's like when I'm raising my children, I made sure that reading was not a punishment, it was always a pleasure. I never said, you know, get to your room and do your homework kind of thing. And, and reading was always associated with the comfort, you know, reading my kids to sleep, and because I knew that they would grow up loving books that way. Both of them now have degrees in uh, English literature. but. As for study tips, for me, it had to be a quiet place. That's all. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, here we are, Captain America over here. Hey. Well, I think the A stands for America, doesn't it? It could be applesauce for all I know. <laughs> Captain Applesauce. Yes, Captain. Uh, I, I, again, because of PT, I just, I like Bugs Life. You know, it's one of the lesser known films, but I, I always enjoy Bugs Life. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Now we have Jesse. Complete with a shield and everything. Oh, Jesse's over here. Hi. From Toy Story. <laughs> what was that song she sang? Oh, she... You got a friend in me? Is that no, hers? No, 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 no. She Loves Me. Oh yeah, that was Randy Newman wrote that. Yeah, that was really sad thing. Toy Story 2 is one of my top three Pixar films. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, my question for you is, um, what do you enjoy most as being an off-screen voice actor? Or is, is there any, for you, a real difference between acting on-screen versus acting off-screen? Yeah, I mean, there's differences t uh, technically. Uh, what do I enjoy about it? It's uh, indoor work and there's no heavy lifting. <laughs> That's first. And um, yeah, it's well, when you're acting on screen, and it's a scene where you're running. Well, you're running. You know, that's, the camera's following you and you're running. Uh, but when you're doing the end, you know, it's just you and this thing here. And so in your head, you have to do the running. You have to make your voice sound like you're running. But uh, again, you know, like I was saying over here, the. Uh, that your, your bag of tricks, your, your bag of skills should include all that. And so, um, and, and so it's, it shouldn't be hard, it's just basically what you do. It's, you know, it's like a surgeon coming and saying, ooh, I really don't know anything about arms. <laughs> you know, you better, you know, it's, it's your job. But nice outfit too, by the way. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Hello, Mr. Katzenberg. How are you, sir? Good, how are you? 
Good. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you. I grew up watching Cheers. Uh, and you did a heck of a job. I, I hope so. <laughs> uh, Cliff Clavin wanted me to, inspired me to become kind of a know-it-all, which I'm sure my friends hate, but that's okay. Uh, and they, they don't, they, nobody understands that. And I always say, there's no such thing as useless knowledge. There's something that you learn when you're seven. You're going to use it someday. You'll be 43. But somebody will go, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, the, the original rope was made of hemp. You know, <laughs> something. Exactly. Well, I know my daughter's growing up watching it on Pixar, so that's fantastic. But my question is, as Cliff Clavin, you got to do so many different things. You were on Jeopardy, you got to go to the Celtics court. What's one thing you wanted to do that you didn't get to do? On uh, Cheers? Yes. As Cliff? Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, there was one thing that they had promised us, uh, uh, one of the, uh, that we were going to go to London in the film. And I thought, yeah, that's cool, Cliff in London. <laughs> uh, Cliff, Cliff and Norm in a real pub. Uh, but that, that it never came to be, so I, I guess that would be uh, the closest. But other than that, okay, I was perfectly happy. Because don't forget, they made me, well, first of all, they paid me. <laughs> and then they made me sit at a bar for 11 years and crack jokes. <laughs> I mean, there should be a law against that. Sort of thing. But, imagine picking up the morning paper and things the one ads. Say, wanted someone to make a fortune and crack jokes at a bar. <laughs> okay, I'm there. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Morning. Morning. Seven years ago, I was staff at this convention back when uh, staff meetings were 20 of us, uh, meeting at a little sub shop. You were stopped? Staff. Oh, staff. Yeah. And one night we did a round robin of who all we wanted to have at the convention. Everybody was answering Stan Lee, Neil Gaiman. My answer is John Rassenberg. Well, so you. I'm glad you're finally here. So are you the reason I'm here? Uh, no. I don't think so. That was a long Take time ago. So. Well, you can just say yes. <laughs> sure. My name is What's your name? Dana. Dana? Dana. What's your last name? Decock. Dana Decock. He's the reason I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. So my question is, uh, was there ever a Pixar role other than the one that you played that you would have liked to have played? A Pixar role that I would have liked to have played? A different character. No. <laughs> no, I, I, I never thought it never occurred to me. I'd see that wish I could have played Woody or uh, so they got somebody else, they got the right person for that. So no, I'm just I'm just uh, happy to be in the sandbox. I don't have to play with all the toys. <laughs> Thank you. I want to start with a confession that my wife will never let me live down. Is that well into my twenties I was convinced that the bubonic plague was spread, was spread by a small creature called the bubon. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, boober. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, speaking of the cliffisms, um, I have two part. Did you write many of those yes. yourself? The, amazing. <laughs> and uh, do you have a favorite one? Well, there was one. Uh, it's, it's very uh, obscure, but well, they're all obscure. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy Burroughs, the director, uh, by the time we were into the second, third year, they were used to me and they could trust me that I'm not going to hog the spotlight with these things I'm making up. Because that's the art of improvisation. It's like being in a, in a jazz combo. You're not there to show how smart you are. You're there to make it entertaining and you, you got to hand off to the bass player or the trumpet player. You know, you, you just throw a little piece in there and step back. And uh, he said, uh, hey, rats, uh, Film in five seconds because the cameras were going to move and they wanted something going on. I said, Yeah. So they all got into action. I grabbed a bar napkin <clears throat> with a pencil, and Paul Wilson was here, George Wendt was on the left. I said, And that gentleman was how the uh, tractor seat was invented. <laughs> you don't need to say anything else, you know, it's because the thing's like, Tract what? So the audience would have their own conversation in their own heads. I, I didn't have to do any work at all. <laughs> Just tell the punchline. I remember that one. 
Thank you. So, after all these years, now that your voice has kind of become the Easter egg of every Pixar movie, I'm wondering if uh, you've ever considered... Do uh, Jewish people understand what that reference means? <laughs> I should make that my eyes water, but also I'm thrilled to be here. And, uh, my role in Brave was very underplayed. Just, What's that? Yeah, your role in Brave was very underplayed. Hey, and, Garden. <laughs> hey, but, 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 hey, I love Scotland. I spent a lot of time up there. But, yeah. but, oh, some drugs here now. <laughs> I'm wondering uh, if you've ever considered a lead role in any of your voice roles or anything. Not if they ask me, I do it. I just um, I did a small film called The Woodcarver. Um, it uh, well, we filmed it up in Canada. Where I was the lead. Another one called The Village Barber Shop, where I was the lead. And What If? I was one of the leads. Um, but yeah, I, I get to do that. And I just finished a film in Vancouver, uh, where I play a pretty hefty role of the villain in this in this film. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, you know, it, again, it's, I'm so thankful to be part of this business, to be able to make a living at it, that I never, I never really question. I, I've never once said, you know, I'd like some more lines. Because I think, I'm, you know, I should, I, it's their project. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the shades of paint on the artist's palette. You know, when they're, they're painting, and this, or I'll try some of this uh, magenta. Ah, that's me. It's just a little touch of something. That's what all actors are. So it's, unless you're writing the film, directing the film, then just do your job. And don't break it. Hey, John. Hey, what's your name? Miriam. You probably were going to say that anyway. I've been planning up the ones. Yep. So what's the most bizarre thing that's ever happened to you on your travel around the world? Wow, uh, this is quite a few. <laughs> oh, my head's spinning on it. I'm going to faint. Um, boy, uh, well, it was, I mean, there's one that always keep popping up. I was uh, <clears throat> dating this woman who worked in, uh, uh, in France, in Paris. And, uh, and like, you know, over, name it, it's a short hop. You can, uh, get there in just a few hours. So I was waiting for her uh, after her work. She didn't get out of work till uh, you know, it was late. So I, I'll go into this little pub, cafe, and I sit there. And then I, uh, I don't even know what I'm telling this. I never told this story. This is crazy. Um, but I'm sitting. So I'm sitting at the bar, and uh, the bartender comes up and says, "Oh, my little home, you know, whatever he said." <laughs> and uh, I said, the Udami, see you play. Udami means a small, small beer. And so he says to me in French, uh, uh, he says, do you have a small one or a large one, like a man? <laughs> and he says, Udami, you can't pour on. And I said, well, I'm grand, I hate to see you. Well, I just want to run out the clock here. That's all I want to do. Well, there's some guys down the end of the bar, three or four of them. And they're all ho 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 ho. Because now, now I realize what's going on. They're making fun of the American. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, he goes, the, the bartender goes and fills up a bucket with beer, <laughs> like a champagne bucket, and puts it on the bar and goes, and now these guys are going, oh, they really do laugh like that. <laughs> I'm not making that up. They're going, oh, 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 oh. So anyway, I take the bucket because now you know my pride and you know is at stake here. So I took the bucket and I it's all over me, all over the floor, everything. And so one of these said, I put it on the bar and said, Encore, another one. <laughs> now come on, you know, you wanna play this game, buddy? Well, I'm not cleaning up the floor. <laughs> so one of the guys dances is Hey, Yank, why don't you go back to where you belong? I said, excuse me, if it wasn't for the Yanks, you'd be playing a clock and spiel and eating sauerkraut. 
Well, I, I wish you were all there. <laughs> because, because I had no help. It was a dumb thing to say. I've known a yank within 10 miles of the joint. So uh, the, the bar stool was my friend, and that's the only, that's swinging, that was the only way I got out of the place. <laughs> so, oh, but it was very, afterwards when I met, you know, the girl I was, I was dating, well, she thought I was a hero, because she was English, and the English and the French don't get along, so. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I got the bar fight in Paris. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's the story. Cheers, and I grew up spending many restless nights watching Nick at Night, marathoning as much as I could. Um, and one thing that over my years of watching Cheers that became a great interest to me was behind the scenes and what it was like on set. And I was wondering if you could share a fond memory from behind the scenes, and also, was the beer ever real? Um, occasionally the beer was real. Uh, you know, the show, we were filming too late, we knew we had uh, another half hour to go and it's already one in the morning until the prop guy. So we had some signal, I think it was... <laughs> they put a Heineken in there. Um, and behind the scenes? I can't tell you a thing. <clears throat> I mean, I could tell you a lot of things, but there's... Um, I, you know, because the other thing is, I never had to change my costume. So everybody else was behind the scenes, you know, running around, changing their costumes. And I'm, I'm a mailman. So I spent 11 years sitting in the same stool. They're so running around backstage. I'm doing a crossword puzzle. So your behind the scenes was the set? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. But I remember one day, uh, it was in rehearsal, and we were getting bored, and I, I said to Rhea, I said, hey, Rhea, <clears throat> you know I mean? I'm going to uh, whisper a word to George, and George is just going to draw it. And all the time, you see how long it takes you to identify that. Uh, I didn't realize I had invented Pictionary. <laughs> so, you know, years later, you know, someone else had the same thought. But uh, that's how it was anything extraordinary. That's a little bit of stuff like that. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. College, I had no desire to be an actor, and there was a, a gal I was sweet on, or wanted to be, and she was in the drama group, and so I uh, joined the drama group, <laughs> and uh, and I really got to enjoy it. Uh, I really, that's really the what uh, what got me started, in the, my interest in it. I realized, oh, this could be fun, and then it wasn't two years later when I was in England. I thought, you know, I could do this for a living. Yeah. Yeah, but that was that's, that was the inspiration. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, John. I really enjoyed the show, legit. Uh, I loved your character. I thought you were hilarious. Thanks. Um, how was it working on it? You know, did you have a lot of creative input with your character or the whole, whole overall thing? No, it was. Uh, no. It, I just uh, legit, pretty much, you know, memorize the lines and you do your best to make them funny, make them work. Yeah, every now and then you make a, a little uh, adjustment. I mean, I would you say my own lines. I mean, there was one where me and one of my sons, Steve Sutton, legit, were talking about those TV shows. You know, used to be on the air, and I and I stumbled. We were stumbling out of a bar, you know, four sheets to the wind. You remember that? Yeah. And I don't know if they used the line on that show, I didn't see that episode, but uh, the director said, just say something, you know, drunk would say, is that? So I stumbled out, I said, and one more thing, the reason you never see Obama without his shoes on is because he has cloven hoofs. <laughs> 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 
Did they use that line? No, I was probably not. They should have. Though. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're all liberals. No, I, mean, I, I really well, I thought that was just funny because people probably do say things like that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. Uh, what does the underminer do on the ground? Uh, I would probably wash his hands a lot. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and finds different ways to burrow through dirt. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you know, I'm very confident that I'll never get that question again. <laughs> it was the first one, first time, and very good. Good for you. Original question. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mark Bayer, and this is a Cheers question. A couple years ago, in this very room, Ed Asner spoke, and among other things, he talked about how sometimes Ted Knight on the Mary Tyler Moore show was bothered by how unsympathetic Ted Baxter was, and eventually they rewrote the show to make him a little bit nicer. I love Cliff, he's great, but he's sad, he's a little bit lonely, he's a pain in the neck. Carla detests him, Norm doesn't seem to like him very much, and he's his best friend. And what I want to ask is, did that aspect of Cliff ever bother you the way it did Ted Knight? And if so, how did you deal with it as an actor? Uh, I, I just did my job, got my check and went home. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, if you let stuff like that bother you, it's not real life. You know, if, if when I went home, my kids hated me, and they thought I was long-winded or whatever, that bothered me. But stuff uh, on a character in a TV show, you know, the show, if it, if it works, you know, don't fix it. So we had, you know, it was a popular show. It was you know, number one, between number one and five for ten years. But it did change because, uh, now as you mentioned it in the beginning, uh, Cliff really was the font of all knowledge, and uh, and the coach was just fascinated with Cliff. Like Cliff knows everything, and that was the original intent. And then other writers came in with, uh, you know, their own agendas, and Cliff became more buffoonish. And, um, but it would be like, you know, swimming upstream with an anvil, uh, you know, to go and say, you know what, it's really not worth my time. But the uniform's in the Smithsonian. Wow. So there you go. I'll have to go and see it. You're obviously very different from Ted Knight. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, he, has, he had nicer hair, though. <laughs> yes? Hi, my name is Leah Howerton. Hi. Um, I have two questions. My first one is, um, behind the scenes of Pixar, did you ever play any pranks on anyone, or did anyone play a prank on you? At Pixar? In Pixar. No, because I'm always recording by myself, so there's really no one to play a prank on. Uh, but I always ask them to book me either before or after Don Rickles. Uh, that way I, I get to see Don. And uh, he's, just, he's talking about storyteller. He's got the greatest stories in the world. It's about an era of Hollywood that probably will never exist again. So I just I relish, I just drink all that up. But as far as tricks, uh, no, but you got me thinking. Uh, I think I will. <laughs> Uh, I know where John Rassler lives, so I'll bring a whoopee cushion over to his house. Alice, <laughs> y'all. Uh, and my second question is, can you say a line as Ham um, when he says, um, okay, nobody look, I gotta put my cork back in. Can, can you say it? <laughs> I can't do it. Give me the shot. I can do all your voices. I can do hey. Turn around, I'm trying to get my cork back in. <laughs> Look at writers, they work, uh, they'll work three or four years just on the story. And when they get the script exactly how they want it, they'll throw it out and start again from scratch. <laughs> that's, that's how serious they are about their work. Yes, Madonna. Working on so many Pixar movies, 
um, specifically Monsters University and Monsters. <laughs> Welcome to the Himalayas! <laughs> That's actually one of my campus' favorite lines. Thank you. Um, uh, again, it's, the process is just is really walking in, uh, and you're, you're in, a, in a, a room with the director, a big room. It's not a, like a broom closet or anything. And otherwise, I'd have to lose weight. Um, and with Pixar, it's 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 they do all the heavy lifting because the writer, who's also the director. They've been writing this, like I said, for three or four years, and they know every nuance, they know every breath that every character takes, and the, 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 the octave that speaks it, because they know what's happened before and after. So at Pixar, you simply do what the director asks you to do. And if they made another Monsters Incorporated movie, would you do it? Oh yeah, like I said, if they wanted me to, uh, do landscaping, I'd do it. I, I, oh, absolutely, I would. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say that, uh, much like Cliff, I also believe that the greatness of civilizations is determined by how comfortable their footwear is. But, uh, how comfortable the what? Their footwear is. <laughs> right, yeah. And, well, it's, it's funny, because it's, this is how like Cliff I am. From when my kids were very young, I said, you got two things that you need to spend money on. As if your shoes and your mattress. Because <laughs> if you're not standing in one, you'll end down in the other one. <laughs> so don't script and say, well, I'll get the cheaper mattress. No, nah, that's not going to work. You want the best man, you want the best sleep, and you, you, you don't want your feet to get tired. But, so that's, that's why I, I did Cliff in the audition. <laughs> My question was, did you have to go to Norway for The Empire Strikes Back, and what no. was that one's parents like? No, I, uh, I was only indoors, um, so we shot that in the soundstage in Elstree Studios, which is north of London, I guess you'd call it. But the uh, treat for me, which also made my mother very proud, is uh, my parking space was pulled in the first day, and there was a sign on the parking space, space right next to mine, Kermit. So my parking space was next to Kermit's. That's where I knew I had made it. I think it was the only space available anyway. But I took a picture of it immediately and sent it to my mother. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. I, I remember the uh, Rebel Legion costume Star Wars group. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you for becoming an honorary member. Yes, well, thank you. Thanks for uh, allowing me into the club. There's, there's a lot of clubs out there. <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, big fan of uh, Cheers. What's either the silliest or the craziest thing that ever happened on Cheers? I know on a lot of these shows, there's things that happen that are never filmed or never oh yeah, no, tons, stories. tons. Uh, a lot of things happen. Um, let's see. Well, when Kirsty started, here's a story I, I can tell without anybody uh, going run into their attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, Kirsty was uh, cast to replace uh, Shelley Long, uh, George and I were charged with getting her a present because the rest of us were eating lunch and. So it'd be nice to get her something. It might have been my idea or George's. They said, okay, well, well, well you, want, you guys go ahead and do it. All right. So we take off in the car and we go, what are we going to get her? We, I don't know. I mean, we're guys, really. You know, we have no idea. So um, I think it was me and Kim with the idea to pass in the sports space. So let's get her a shotgun. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> Wrapped it up beautifully and put the note on there, you're gonna have to shoot your way out. <laughs> so that's the story that uh, yeah, not many people know. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Wow. Let's have cake. Um, I just want to, you have a lot of great stories. And you've done a lot of things and, and been involved in a lot of t television programs and movies. And I just want to hear more. So what's something that we, your fans, may not already know about you that you'd like to share with us today? <laughs> Let's see, my socks match. <laughs> Made sure of that because oftentimes they don't. Oh, there's a, yeah, because somebody pointed this out to me the other day. They were almost floored by it. In, in, in the uh, packaging world, when you pack things to ship, there's a, a packaging that uh, you can get in a lot of places. It's a strip of paper uh, that's accordionized, you know, kind of like folded back on itself, sort of springy. You see it in Starbucks, they have it in there, they use it for packaging and this and that. Well, that was me, I invented that. Really? Yeah. I started, it was up in the Seattle area, long story, but I started a company and had employees and uh, after a while I uh, sold the company and now it's worldwide, but that's me. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I've always been a tinker. I always like to tinker with the things I did and uh, have to my mother's responsible for that. She'd always buy me old appliances when I was very young, three, four years old, and cut off the cord and then, you know, hand me a screwdriver, a pair of pliers, and here you go, take it apart. And I did, so to this day, I love gadgets, fiddling with stuff. Do you think needs fixing? I got a lot of things that need fixing. Okay, we'll be over in 20 minutes. I'm a big fan of Cheers. The first thing I did when I went to Boston was make my friend take me to go to Cheers. That's, I just love it so much. What is your favorite piece of useless knowledge that you just like to share with people? Well, I always think, again, uh, there's no such thing as useless knowledge. So you're going to use it somewhere, sometime, I don't know, some bizarre location in Reykjavik, I don't know. But, uh, so it comes in handy some. Now, I've never been uh, defeated in Trivial Pursuit. And, uh, but I'm sure uh, that's coming soon because I know nothing about Justin Bieber. Or, uh, that's okay. Uh, just, any of those questions that go on. I'm a deer in the headlight. I have no idea. But, uh, like a random fact. A random fact? Um, all right, well, whale ships uh, built in Massachusetts back in the day were pink. And many people don't know that because I, I had a, a, a commission, a boat to be built. I still have it. It was 25 years ago, but I still have it. It's a beautiful little uh, growing sailing skiff. And this company out of Ames, Amesbury, Massachusetts, they built those big whaling ships back in the day. And uh, anyway, in the conversation, he said, he said that uh, most of those big ships were pink because they'd use, for paint, they'd use linseed oil, milk, and cranberries. Because there's a lot of cranberries there. And they crush them up. So when you see a movie of a whaling ship and the guys are on, they're standing on a pink boat. <laughs> make a lot of stuff up on the fly. I give them what they want, and, uh, and I usually say, let me, let me just do one for myself. And uh, sometimes they'll use that, sometimes they won't. But I actually won, once won a Clio Award for advertising, but nobody told me. <laughs> the right, it was, I did something, it was in Minnesota, it was for a pancake company, 
and I did exactly what they required. And then I said, uh, I said, let me do one for myself. So I did. And, oh, and, uh, and everybody went home. And I didn't know, but that's the commercial they used because it was a local commercial. And they won this big prestigious award for best writing. <laughs> and I didn't know until 10 years later I ran into some guy at an airport. He goes, oh, hey, yeah. Uh, we probably didn't know that you won a Clio award, but the other, but the writers took the credit for it. <laughs> oh, one day I'll get them. <laughs> Revenge is a dish best served cold. <laughs> one day. You bet. Hey, John, I have some bad news. What? We have about five minutes left. What? <laughs> well, who's coming up after me? I believe that is Carrie Ewells. Well, he can sit here. As you wish. All right, I'll get her So we got, we're going to give you a couple rapid fire. Get some more. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just truncate my answers. Go ahead, okay. sir. I'm going to take you back a bit. Um, it's one of my favorite horror movies. I love the cheese. But did you lose a bar fight or did you lose a bet? I want to know the story behind Motel Hell. Oh, that was a buddy of mine directing that. And I had just arrived in Los Angeles from London. And I had worked with him in England on two or three films. And he says, you want a part? I said, yeah, okay, give me something to do. And that's how that happened. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I just got two quick questions for you. Um, what, what actress or actor did you uh, have the best time working with? I was lucky enough, to, um, I did a film called Ragtime in England, and, uh, and I actually got to work with James Cagney. And that was cool. And then I go, got to Los Angeles, the very first project I did, um, it was with James Stewart and Ben Davis. So, I mean, I thought, how, how lucky can you get? But, um, I, I, there's actors I admire, uh, like Robert Duvall. I mean, he can do more with his eyebrow than most actors can do their entire careers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I, uh, Lee Marvin, I don't know if anybody remembers Lee Marvin. There's a film called Black, uh, Bad Day at Black Rock, and he's in the background in a lot of the scenes, but your eye goes right to him. He's doing nothing, but him doing nothing looks was more entertaining than other actors acting. Um, yeah, he's interesting too. Uh, there's a little bit of trivia for you. Um, Lee Marvin, as most of you know, was in the Marine Corps, was at Iwo Jima. And his sergeant was a, another Marine named Bob Keeshan, who went on to become Captain Kangaroo. So there you go. And my uh, second question was, is which, uh, what's been your favorite kind of prop or, or thing to take home from a set or from a movie that you've got to keep as a keepsake? Uh, the leading lady in one film. That was how we the long that day. <laughs> oh, you think I was kidding? Sorry. I'm ready for another answer. Uh, I, I, I can't think of anything. I, I've never really taken any home. But I'll, I'll make something up. Um, uh, a can of turtle wax. There you go. John, unfortunately, I think that's going to be our last question. I don't care, I'm a rebel. Well, thank you. Thank you, one and all. For these